When I went through the double doors back there this morning after the service, one of the first questions that met me was, you do have more for us, don't you? <laughs> and I said, I'm glad the Lord does. Acts chapter 7. <clears throat> We're just going to read two verses and launch into our message where we left off this morning. I really was blessed and edified by the uh, services this morning, every part of it. And didn't Brother Jamie do good with that? Yes, I'm telling you what, I was proud of him. <laughs> proud of the Lord in him. Yes, that's it. Acts 7, 54 and through 56. Notice the difference between they and but he. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God and said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. We begin this morning by saying these men could not see the glory of God because they could not see the glory of the law to begin with. And I want us to look, if you, if you don't mind, this afternoon, uh, we're going to Matthew chapter 5, but let me pick up one verse in 2 Corinthians 3 and verse number 6. And I want you to see that the law has both letter and spirit. You've got to see this before we go to Matthew 5. You already know this verse, but you don't know it in context of this message. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse number 6. Paul said, God hath also made us able ministers of the new covenant of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. Now the Old, old Testament, the Old Covenant, uh, it had a letter to it that would kill you, but there was a Spirit to that letter. If a good friend writes you a letter, you say, well, somebody say, well, how is he doing? You say, well, this and this and this. Did he specifically say that to you? You say, no, but I could read it between the lines. You ever said that? Oh, yeah. The letter has a spirit to it because you know the person. And you're reading it from a, an, an awareness of that person and his character. Yeah. That's the way the law was supposed to be. That's the way the gospel is. So there's a spirit to this thing. And Paul said, you better be careful. You preach it in the spiritual meaning. And our brother brought us out very clearly this morning uh, before the Lord's table. That Jesus said, my words are spirit and they are life. And he said, the flesh that you eat, and you're talking about eating and drinking, it profiteth nothing. But it's the spirit that you're supposed to be eating and drinking, and that's what has life to us. Now, I want to show you the greatest message on the law you'll ever read. And you, you brought it with you this morning. You don't have to buy a book. You've had it all the time. Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. Those of you that were here Wednesday night, we read this to you then. It won't hurt you. It's still in your Bible. We'll read it to you again. But I want to make a point. We're talking about how these men did not see the glory of the law. And they said that if you do away with the customs of Moses, you have done away with the law. And they indicted the person of Jesus of Nazareth in with Stephen and said he said he would do it. But let me read you Christ's words. We want to get Christ up on the, up on the testimony stand and raise the right hand and tell us the truth. Here he is as the, uh, in his testimony for himself. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 17 and I hate to put Jesus in the place of just being a, a witness to testify. I don't mean to dim diminish him. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. Matthew 5, 17. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. He said in John 3, I came not into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through me might be saved. So he has a positive uh, mission and not a negative one. I am not come to destroy the law. I am not come to destroy the prophets. And again, I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. 
For verily, surely, truly, I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, not one semicolon or comma, not one jot or tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. John said, Jesus, it would do well if you baptized me. He said, no, do it like I'm asking you to, because it behooveth us to fulfill all righteousness. I want to fulfill this thing. That's, my, that's what I'm designed to do. Now listen. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. If, if Stephen and I are rightly indicted in Acts 6, 13, and 14, then we are the least in the kingdom of heaven. But we know that's not the truth. The Lord Jesus Christ is, is the Lord of heaven and earth. So what they are saying that he is breaking is not the law of God. Jesus Christ wouldn't do that. Right. What they didn't like was that Stephen and Jesus Christ was breaking their concept of the law. They were breaking the letter that these, these men held to and not the spirit of the thing. They were not, Jesus and Stephen were not even breaking the letter of the law as God expressed it. Just the way the, these guys interpreted it and made a religion out of. Old boy Caldwell used to say, if you make a God out of God, he'll kill you and you'll die and go to hell. You don't need to make a God out of God. He's already a God. You don't make, need to make a religion out of the law. It, just face it as it is. But not these guys. They had to take it and misuse it and make something out of it. And then if you break that, then you're not right with God. All right. Here we go. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. They are the most legal minded and they are they, they obey their laws and rules and regulations with such a minute detail that they they are the height of legalistic morality. Now, your righteousness has got to exceed that. You say, well, man, I can't get in there and become a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He said, no. But the righteousness of those who have believed by faith in Jesus Christ and have his righteousness imputed to them exceeds the righteousness of the scribes. In other words, you've got to be saved and not just a religionist. That's boiling it down to brass tacks. You need to be born again with the Spirit in you and not just a legalistic religionist. All right. Now, I want you to notice this in your Bible. And I've marked mine. You might want to do it too. We're now going to see these phrases. You have heard that it was said by them of old. And then you're going to see the phrase, but I say unto you. Now, it's going to happen over and over and over again. First, Jesus prefaces his sermon with his responsibility to the law. I came to fulfill it. Secondly, he says, I want you to understand everybody better obey that law and teach that law. And anybody that goes against that law is the least in the kingdom. And then he says, there is a morality of scribes and Pharisees legalism that will be superseded and will be overcome and will... Uh, it will excel those righteousnesses of their legalistic morality. There is something that's greater than that. Yes. Now, I want to be specific. That's his general preface. Now he's going, to take, he's going to take one at a time and break it down. The first phrase is very important. You have heard that it was said by them of old time. It don't say you have heard that Moses said. It doesn't say you have heard that God told Moses to write this down. He's saying 
You have heard your whole religion in Jerusalem right now and in Israel is based on what these guys think they heard and they have passed it down until it's become something entirely different. Amen. Thank God there is a but I say unto you to straighten it out. All right, here we go. Verse 21. Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, Thou shalt not kill. Well, that's pretty good. And whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. Now, how can he go against that? Because that's the letter. Listen at the spirit. My words are spirit and they are life. That's what Brother Jamie read us, John 6, 63. God is a spirit. They that worship him must worship him in spirit. All right, but I say unto you, let me tell you and give you an exposition of my interpretation of Exodus 20, 13. That whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of judgment, not just whoever kills him. And whosoever uh, shall say to his brother, Raka, that is thou fool, or I guess, let's see, shall be in danger of the council, okay. But whosoever shall say thou fool shall be in danger of hell, fi hell fire. You're going to have to treat men in such a way as to show respect to God. Mankind is made in God's image. You can't show respect to God except to show respect to men. That's it. See, this is a broader, a spiritual, and more deeply expressed law than just, thou shalt not kill. Well, check, I, don't, I ain't kill nobody. Yeah, but that ain't all there is to it. Therefore, if thou bring thy gift to the altar and want the Lord to accept it, and there rememberest thy brother hath ought against thee. And Brother Jamie read us John 14, 26 this morning. The Holy Spirit will bring to your remembrance. The Holy Spirit will make you remember, hey, you know you're up here with that beam in your eye. Yeah. You got to go back yonder. You know, you've been fussing to that fellow about the speck in his urine. You need to get things right with him. You, you're, uh, what makes you think I'm going to accept you in your hypocritical state if you don't get straightened out with that brother? Notice, never mind. Leave there thy gift before the altar and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother and then come and offer thy gift. And, and uh, he, goes, he, he goes on in that. Look at verse 27. Second thing. Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not commit adultery. That's it. Okay, I didn't kill nobody, I ain't committed adultery, I'm fine. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already. Where? Where does man believe unto righteousness? In his heart. Where does the fool say there is no God? You got to watch out. It's, it's not a matter of just physical enticement. It's not a matter, of, let me say that differently, scratch that out. It's not a matter of, 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 of sexual and physical uh, involvement only. It's a matter of enticement in your soul. You've got to conquer yourself for the glory of God. Amen. It's a broader, broader thing. And you know, every time a man looks at a woman lust after, he don't have to come down in front of the church and say, I've committed adultery. But the law working in his heart makes him know he has. And it's up to him to go before God. And God is saying, quit trying to get all this stuff, uh, all, this, uh, uh, all, all this stuff drug into the presence of God by saying, well, we've obeyed the law. When you need to get your heart right. It's about God commuting himself in his holiness to you. It's, it's God bringing you into the awareness of his own righteousness. And he said, let me show you how how serious this is if thy right eye offend thee if it's just your eye looking at that woman your right eye plug it out and cast it from thee for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish the physical should suffer not that thy whole body should be cast into hell it's not a matter just of the physical it's a matter of the soul 
and of your eternal standing with God. This is something we have to work on. And ladies, don't think you're left out of this if you look upon a man to lust after him. Same thing, same song, second verse. It's for both sexes and it says everybody's going to do this. That's a part of the human flesh. And so it will keep you under an understanding that the law is holy and just and good and I'm the one that's sold under sin. The law is spiritual. There's nothing wrong with it. It's me. It's the weakness of the flesh that the reason that God had to send his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin to condemn sin in the flesh. So the spiritual law of God keeps us all understanding that we have come short of the glory. And it makes you want to do uh, uh, better. And, and when I say that, I'm not talk, talking about just your efforts. It's want, wanting you to seek to Christ for him to make dead everything in you that lusts. And that he would enhance everything in you that brings glory to God. And that you're seeking your purity. And not just saying, well, I'm better than they are. Why, he shot a man one time. Or I'm better than he, he or she is. They committed adultery. No, we ain't better than anybody. If the modern day, fundamental, right wing, sovereign grace, whatever you want to call them, church don't, get, don't quit saying us and them and get back to God and the rest of us. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. A lot of them fellows believe in total depravity, but they don't believe that them and their grandkids are depraved. Hello. So it's us and them. Why? We keep the law. There ain't nobody ever kept the law but Jesus. Admit it. You don't keep the law. I don't keep the law. I don't even want to keep the law at some times. I want to do what I want to do. I'm trying to be honest with you. Ain't no sense me getting up here and lying to you. We might as well just go home. But dear soul, God has to give me the want to. Right. And God's the only one that can con convict me of sin when I didn't want to. It all hinges upon Christ and the spirit of the word and the Holy Spirit dwelling within us. Amen. Again, drop on down in verse number 31. It hath been said... You do realize this is Jesus taking up the modern day preachers in his day, don't you? And what they had done to the scriptures. It has been said, where? In the pulpits. Whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorce. But I say unto you, that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causes her to commit adultery. And whosoever shall marry her, that is divorced, committeth adultery. Again, ye have heard, verse 33, that it hath been said of them of old time. Thou shalt not forswear thyself, but thou shalt perform unto the Lord thine oath. But I say unto you, swear not at all. I am so sick of people today saying, oh my God. You, you better call on somebody that knows you. It's unbelievable. If you don't say it, it's OMG on your text. We need to watch our mouths. Listen, God says, swear not at all. Uh, they said, uh, you, need to, you need to make sure you, know, you do it in the right way. In verse 33, Jesus said, don't ever do it. For heaven is God's throne, earth is God's footstool. Neither Jerusalem is the city of the great king. They shall not swear by your head. You can't make your hair white or black or make it quit falling out. But let your communication be yes and no. For whatsoever is more than these cometh of it. Now it's a little broader than saying, well, you better be careful how you swear. Uh, you, you need to perform what you say and then it'll be all right. God said, no, don't do it. Verse 38, ye have heard that it hath been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you, resist not evil. Verse 43, ye have heard that it hath been said, thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thy enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, 
and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Why? In order that, verse 45, you may be seen to be the children of your Father which is in heaven. Where did that high note come from? <laughs> heaven. That you may be seen to be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his Son to rise on the earth, on the evil, and on the good. You are not supposed to be trying to be, you are not supposed to be better, seeking to be better than the other guy. You're supposed to be trying to be as good as God. Right. Yeah, that's true. Amen. Amen. If you're not seeking by the Holy Ghost and by grace and by mercy right. and by the blood of the Lamb of God, Dear soul, then you cannot exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees and we ain't no different than them if all we're trying to do is be better than the other guy. This is in order that you might be able to be seen as to be the children of your father who makes his son rise on the evil and the good and the rain on the just and on the unjust. If you just love people that love you, you don't have any thank. If you salute your brethren, only what do you more than others? Don't even the tax collectors, the Gentiles, and the heathen do that? Dear soul, if you don't see the glory of the law, you are nothing more than a publican, a Gentile, and a heathen. Amen. God said it. Now listen at verse 48. Be ye therefore. Be ye therefore. Perfect. Now you can look that up and try to make it say everything you know, but that, but it ain't going to come out nothing but that. Right. Be ye therefore perfect. How? Even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. See, Christianity is not a religion. It's a supernatural way of life. It cannot be imitated or duplicated by human effort. It is a higher thing. It, it, it descends from God. Religion is God trying to reach up to man. Salvation is, it is... Did I say that right? Religion is man trying to reach up to God. Did I, don't, did I say that right? Did I, did I really? I don't know what happened in my head. I thought I said it wrong. All right, religion is man trying to reach up to God. But true spiritual salvation is God reaching down to man Amen. and pulling him up. Yes. And I want you to know that that what you've been doing, Gene Breed, for seven years as a Southern Baptist. And I went to choir practice on Thursday night. And I was involved with the young people and I sang in the youth choir. And I didn't spit on the sidewalk. I didn't chew tobacco or smoke. But I was as wretched as anybody else in the whole world who wasn't saved. Amen. God said there's something better than that. And he grabbed me, and I had hair back then. Grabbed me by the hair of the head, pulled me up and said, you got you to gotta live on a better level. I thought I was. But boy, when God showed me salvation, there was so much difference between salvation and religion. I couldn't believe it. I didn't even think like I used to think. And I thought I thought pretty good. Do you see it? This is Jesus preaching on the law. Take time to read it. Take time to study it. Understand what he's saying to you. The law, dear soul. 2 Corinthians 3. 2 Corinthians 3. The law has a glory. The law has a glory. 2 Corinthians 3, 7. But if the ministration of death, written and engraven in stones, was glorious. It was glorious. So that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses. Why? For the glory. That's twice he's mentioned it. Of his countenance. Third time, which glory was to be done away with. I don't care if it was to be done away. It was still glorious. You can't do away with that which did not exist. The glory had to exist in order for you to do away with it. So, the, the, the preface, it, it, no, the, the, uh, 
The statement is this. The truth is this. I forgot the word I was going to use. The law is glorious. So we come to understand, then he says, how shall not the ministration of the Spirit, that is the New Testament, the Gospel, not written on stones like the law of the old age, how shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? But if the ministration of condemnation, that is the law, be glory, much more doth the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. Let's go to the ocean again. Get your, get your cup, get your glass. Dip it out. Go back to the motel room. What you got? I got the Atlantic Ocean. No, you hadn't. You got a glass full. Is it the same quality as the Atlantic Ocean? Yes. But it ain't the same quantity. Did Moses have a glory? Did the law have a glory? Yes. Was it the same glory? It was God. Yes. So God ain't less glorious one place or more glorious than another. He's glorious like he always is all the time. He had the glory, but it was just a thimble for him. And then here comes Jesus with a big old wash tub and just poured it out all of us on Pentecost. So it was the glory that excelleth. Listen. Verse number 10. For even that which was made glorious, that is the law, it had no glory in this respect. When did it not have any glory? By reason of the glory that excelleth. For if that which is done away was glorious, and it was, much more that which remaineth is glorious. So there is a glory of the law. That's, that's what these guys could not see. So they could not come on to receive the whole Atlantic Ocean. They didn't receive the cup full. They were those who believed and you have heard that it was said by them of old. This is all you got to do. Jesus said, no, you got to do this. You got to do a whole lot more. There's a spirituality in this. You don't have the spirit of the law. You don't have the glory of the law. Therefore, all they were concerned about were the customs of Moses. That was it. And dear soul, still the same way in today with the customs of the Baptist. Hebrews chapter 8. Hebrews chapter 8. God told Moses in verse 5 to, to, make the heaven, to make the tabernacle according to the pattern showed to thee in the mount. Verse 6. But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which is established or enacted upon better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. But finding fault, two words please. Ah, oh, he didn't say but finding fault with it as if he were talking about the law. No. He said finding fault with, what was your word? Them. And don't turn there, but remember Romans 8.3. What the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. It's us. <clears throat> I keep running up to soprano all the time. It's us. It's us. I don't know what's going on. But anyhow, yeah, it, 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 the problem was with us. The law, there's nothing wrong with the law. If God were to give it all over again, he'd give it exactly like he did the first time. Because there was nothing wrong with it. All right, where were we? Verse number, chapter 8, verse number 8. Yeah, okay. For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord. Here's God saying, now I know what's wrong. It's the flesh that's wrong. 
uh, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt because the law wasn't no good. Three words. Because they couldn't continue. You said, son, don't get in that cookie jar. We're fixing to have supper. Next thing you hear is the clanging of the cookie jar lid. They just can't do it. He says, lead them out of the land of Egypt because they continue not in my covenant and I regarded them not, not I regarded the law to be a failure, saith the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, that is after the Old Testament, after the old economy, saith the Lord. All right. I'm not going to make a new law. I'm just going to put the same law, my laws, into their mind and write them in their hearts and not on cold tables of stone. And I will be to them a God and they shall be to me a people and they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother saying, Know the Lord, know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest. And it will require mercy to do so to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities will I remember no more. In that he saith a new testament, a new covenant, he hath made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to what? Vanish away. away. God's very clear in his mind. He understands it. It's, there's nothing wrong with my law. We just wrote it on tables of stone, not so that you would try to keep it and be saved and oops, we messed up. No, I never intended for you to be saved by the law. Genesis 3.15, he started the gospel back then, he shall bruise Satan's head, right? right? right, right. It's going to have to be substitution, it's going to have to be a savior come. So I didn't give you the law in order for you to keep the law to be able to be saved. I gave you the law to show you that you couldn't keep the law in order that you would see the need of Messiah. Amen. You're getting some good stuff here today. It took me 71 years to come to this. And it really has had an effect on me. I thank God for it. He regarded them not. Now, uh, they, they, they couldn't see the glory of God. They could not see the glory of the law. Romans chapter 1. A brief summary review what is sin all have sinned and come short of the glory of God what do we got to do to get back right with God recover the glory of God how shall we recover the glory John 1 14 we beheld him and, and the word became flesh and dwelt among him and uh, dwelt among us and we beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the father full of grace and truth Jesus Christ brought the glory back. Amen. Now listen to this. Romans chapter 1, verse 21. I'm not reading you any scriptures that you hadn't read a million times. It's just God's putting them together today for us to give us a clearer understanding of Stephen seeing the glory. Romans 1, 21. Because that when they knew God, here's where they failed. What's the rest of it? They glorified him not as God. How do you know somebody's not glorifying God? The next phrase will give you the, the sure evidence that somebody's not glorifying God. Neither were thankful. Well, good luck to you. Man, I don't need no luck. I need God. There ain't no such thing as fate, a happenstance, a chance, a luck. 
It's just God. So if, if you say, well, uh, you know, I'm the captain of my fate. I'm, I control my own destiny. Hey, you're in trouble. I tried that myself and I got shipwrecked. <laughs> they failed at the glory and then they were not thankful, but became vain in their imaginations. And that became, that came to darken their heart, their foolish heart. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. What's the first stronghold he mentions? Casting down imagination. The gospel will recover for you everything you lost in Adam. Amen. Brother Brett, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. And you'll come to a greater peace and a greater peaceful revelation in God Almighty by having the gospel return you with an effectual work of the Holy Ghost back to the place where not only like you were in Adam because you don't want to be that why because Adam failed how you know he could fall because he did but you can't fall in Christ and, and so the, the, the imagination is recovered but how did it become vain to start with they weren't thankful how come they they started being unthankful. They didn't glorify him as God. Well, why is that a problem? Because they knew he was glorious to start with. And verse 22, professing themselves to be wise, they became what? Fools. Fools. And changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like an incorruptible man to birds, four-footed beasts, and creeping things. Verse 28. And even as they, didn't like to, they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a mind void of judgment. That's what reprobate mind means. To gave him over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy. Next word. Murder. Murder. And here we have the guys accusing Stephen. Going to murder him. Where'd that come from? They failed at the glory of God. Now it took me an hour this morning and almost 40 minutes this afternoon to finally get around to showing you in the Bible that these guys being murderers failed at the glory of God. So now you can go back and believe all that I said to start with. They were murderers. Why? They failed at the glory of God. What glory could they have seen? The glory of God in the law. And as they failed the glory of God in the law, they, they failed at the glory of God in the gospel. And you can read on if you want to. Look at Romans 2, verse 6. Who will render, God will render to every man according to his deeds. Listen. To them who by patient continuance in well-doing do what? Are you seeking for glory? And are you in patient continuance doing that well? I don't mean you're successful in it. I mean, God will help you to be successful. I mean, are you pursuing it without ceasing? Are you, have you ever stopped and quit on God? No, I'm pursuing on for the glory. I'm seeking for the glory. And if you seek for honor and immortality, what will God grant you? The last two words in verse 7. You are assured that you shall have eternal life if you're seeking for the glory. But unto them that are contentious, I give you Stephen's accusers, and do not obey the church, excuse me, obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath, tribulation, and anguish upon every soul that doeth evil. God shall give them tribulation and anguish upon all their souls of the Jew first and also to the Gentiles. But listen, but glory, honor, and peace to every man that worketh good to the Jew first and also to the Gentiles, for there is no respect of God's with persons. And it goes on down to say, if you, are, uh, if you have sinned in the law, you'll be judged by the law. Uh, if, you, if, if you sin without the law, you'll be judged without 
And it's not the hearers of the law that are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. And you better understand that he's talking about doing that which excels in righteousness above the scribes and Pharisees. And you better read all of Jesus's, but I say unto you, and understand how he and the Holy Spirit are compatible in this. They both believe and will both help you understand the spirituality and the glory of the law. Isn't that good? He says, For when the Gentiles which have not the law, verse 14, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves, which show the work of the law where? Where'd God say he was going to write it next time? In the fleshly tables of the heart. Their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. That's how the gospel works. Uh, we don't have to come in and have the Ten Commandments written on a board. You know, we check you off every Sunday. You got the law of God written in your heart. And your conscience will either excuse you or accuse you. And you don't have to wait till Sunday for it to do it. Man, God was at me on Monday. Or, or, or Tuesday night. It don't make any difference. You mess up, bam, you know it. And you get it right, right then. That's what God's talking about. There is a spirituality to this thing. Chapter 9 of Romans. Chapter 9. Verse 3. For I could wish that myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth the adoption, and what else? And the glory. They had it. And the covenants, and the giving of the law, and the service of God, and the tabernacle, and the promises, whose are the fathers. Our Bible is written mostly by Jews. And of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came, who is over all, God blessed forever. Amen. But then why did it not work? It was not as though the word of God had not taken any effect. The problem is, again, it's not the law, it's the flesh. For they, all, they are not all Israel, which are of Israel. And I tried to refer you to that this morning. And it wasn't that the law... The word didn't work. It was that the, the flesh was weak. And they were not the children of God. They were the children of the flesh. And you can read on down later and find out about that. Our time is getting away from 2 Corinthians 5. In verse 12. Now. What do these religious men glory in? Let me read it to you. 2 Corinthians 5, 12. For we, that is Apostle Paul speaking of himself in the third person, we commend not ourselves again to you. I ain't tooting my own horn. But give you occasion to glory on our behalf. I'm trying to tell you what God has done through me. So that if you want to glory on our behalf, so that you might have somewhat to answer them which, what, what, what? Glory. What do they glory in? What other people think about. And what are the last four words? Where do you believe under righteousness? Whereas the fool said there is no God. Ain't that something? I said, Lord, why don't these fellas just get tired of religion and quit? He said, they can't. I said, I sure do wish they would. It'd be a whole lot easier on the rest of us. He said, no, it won't ever happen. Because they glory in appearance. Find me one single syllable that Jesus ever said that brought attention to his own self as vainglorious. 
you can't do it. And if anybody ought to have been glorified and honored, it ought to have been him. And he will be one day. Now, I got that much more to go. Let me just say this. In chapter 1 of Ephesians, if you can't, if you have problem with election, it's because you have, you can't see the glory. It, it, it winds up that every time he talks about one of the works of the Holy Spirit, of the Trinity rather, it, it is for the glory. Election, verses 1 through 5, is to the praise of the glory of his grace. So those people who can't see the glory will have a problem with election. And those people who have a problem with election usually can't see the glory. They're usually thinking about the kids and the grandkids and not about God. If you have a problem with the definite atonement of the Son in verses 7 through 12, you have a problem with the glory for the atonement winds up that, he should be, that we should be to the praise of his glory. And if you have problem with eternal security, verses 13 through 14, which is the work of, of the Holy Spirit, it said we're sealed by that Holy Spirit of promise unto the praise of his glory, verse 14. If you have problem with the effects you're calling, it's because you can't see the glory. I don't have time to read it. 1 Thessalonians 2.12, 2 Thessalonians 2.14. We don't need to try to make Armenians into Calvinists. You're fighting on the wrong battlefield. Amen. What you need to do is worship God in the, all the glory he's given you. And even if you can't convey it, and I have not been able to convey it in three messages since Wednesday night, and you're still going to have more questions about the glory than you have answers. If you can't convey it, don't quit worshiping God in it. Don't quit stressing it to yourself and to others. It doesn't matter, dear soul, whether they come to uh, the jot and tittle of your particular flavor of religion. It matters if they come to the glory of Almighty God. Amen. But I do want you to read this. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 16. Seeing the glory of God will strengthen the spiritual man. We'll end with that. Ephesians 3 verse 16. That he should grant you according to the riches of his glory. To be what? Strengthened Strengthen with might by his spirit in the inner man. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. That ye being rooted and grounded in love may comprehend with all saints. The breadth of God. The length of his glory. The depth of his love. The height of his assurance. It, 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 the glory is essential, dear soul, and, and, and know the love of God which passes knowledge that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. I see three, four that's in here that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened, that Christ may dwell in your hearts, that ye being rooted and grounded in love, that ye may be filled with all the fullness of God. Seeing the glory brings you to a greater maturity and a stronger uh, faith in Jesus Christ. Now let's read the last two verses and we'll be through. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that ye ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. To him be Lord. where? In the church. By? Jesus Christ. How long? Go ahead. And the church said? 